anointing sound an alarm to sinners edify saints that we may resemble your word reflect your glory resound your praise and become renowned in the land in Jesus name Amen the Lord bless you, you may be seated I'm indeed honored to be with you this evening and we bid you grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ um, this is home for me I think we were talking last night we were in the back and sharing how many times I've been here and, and how long I've known uh, Bishop Ray and, and, and Prophetess Brenda Ray and, um, and uh, you know it's kind of funny that God uh, when I was praying about moving to Miami we were praying about starting a church in Los Angeles or in Berkeley I resided in Fresno and um, I was really uh, praying about God I said God where do you want me to go and God challenged me to come all the way back to Miami which is where I was raised and that's you know that, that's a big that's that's a big hop skip and a jump and uh, and at first I was very apprehensive about the move I, I I was going to do it because God said do it. How many of you know you do stuff that God says do, but you fight the whole way? And, uh, but I was going to submit to the will of the Lord. And I think the more that I, I began to think about the people that would be there and that I would be in close proximity with, the more my spirit became settled. And I think two of the people, especially, that resettled my spirit, that I knew it was God's will for me to come here because I would be in close proximity to people that I honor and esteem in ministry was... Uh, Bishop Harold Ray and Prophetess uh, Brenda Ray and I love them so much and, I, and, and accountability is a good thing and so I knew that, that God was sending me to Miami to start a church but he was also sending me to be closer to two people that I, uh, that I consider friends and a vital essential part of my life and my prophetic future and destiny so I'm honored to be here and I'm honored that you guys would invite me to be with you this evening I'm a little late because I got a flat tire and um, and I don't know what to do with stuff like that I'm not mechanically inclined and uh, um, plus I have you know I have these funny kind of rims on the car and nobody wants to touch them because they're scared you know if you keep just factory on it you're right my rims keep spinning and they're like they don't want to touch all that stuff so I had a, it was one ordeal or another Cadillac says we can't fix it because those are not you know factory so see um, money ain't always a blessing <laughs> sometimes sometimes it gets you in trouble sometimes it's easier just to be just be normal but um you know I like to stand out in the crowd praise the Lord you know <laughs> when I when I got my Escalade and I put I put those uh, 23 inch spinners on it and one of my church mothers came mother Jackson she came she said she said baby she said I don't think that's right for a bishop to be driving around with tires that keep spinning I said but mother he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel she said hey well, let him use you baby let him use you you know you ain't a major prophet till you can make the scripture fit anywhere that's when you're a major prophet If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus. I, I don't want to be long tonight. I am somewhat long-winded, and um, my reputation does precede me. I mean, you know, don't ever act surprised, you know. <laughs> when we walk out of church at a certain time, but there's something in my spirit that I want to share with you tonight that I think is of the utmost importance. I heard something echoed in the house a couple of nights ago. And again, everything that I'm speaking this week, I think is tying into the... the primary theme of what is going on and why you have planned these series of services one was because we understand that first natural then spiritual anything that happens in the natural happens in the natural because there's something taking place in the spiritual and the natural gains our attention so that we can understand spiritual truth so when these storms hit Florida one right after another right after another right after another I began to call um, different friends and we tried to discern the will of the Lord what what the word of the Lord was and I have a friend of mine who's a very uh, very liberal uh, Democrat and he's a, a pastor and he said it's the judgment of God coming on Florida because they messed up the election <laughs> 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 then
then I, I told, you know, then I became hyper, super spiritual. And I said, well, you know, anywhere Jesus went, there were storms that preceded him. And being that I'm moving to Miami, this is the universe testifying that a great apostolic anointing is coming into the region. So this is the devil's last hold down before we, well, I'm about to make the devil's knees knock like typewriter keys. When I get through with him, he's going to wake up and apologize. <laughs> but, uh. But, but I believe that the Lord is, is, is definitely saying something to the body of Christ. And um, one of the things that we said last night, I began to look into the scriptures and we dealt with Sunday morning about the power of prevailing praise. That people who praise have no need of ever being afraid of any situation or circumstance that they will encounter. Last night we dealt with the importance of doctrine. Oftentimes that is a neglected, a neglected uh, teaching or truth in the church and it is neglected because like I said the foundation doesn't get a lot of glory we you know I you, nobody gives the foundation glory I don't even give the foundation glory you know I want to spend more time picking out furniture art to go on the wall but the importance was and and the reason I preached that message last night is because the Bible says that the sign that you are a child is that you are tossed to, to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And I think that the storms coming also are a sign of the church being immature. I, I dare to say, and I am somewhat fearful on some level, that success is not always the measuring standard of God's kingdom. In terms of numbers, when I look at the book of Acts, and I look at the modern day church, the modern day church is found wanting. We have sacrificed essentials for, for the masses. We have compromised the basic standards of truth to gain numbers in our congregation. And I think that it is very, very essential that if we want to hear me, hear me, I'm going to make a prophetic declaration right here. And this is coming by the Holy Ghost. If the church wants to appropriate apostolic power, it must first approximate the apostolic life that was lived in the book of Acts. We have a generation that wants the miracles, they want the provision, they want the supernatural, but they do not want to do what the church did to get that supernatural and the Bible says they continued steadfastly hear me in the apostles doctrine not the prophets not the evangelists not the pastor and not the teachers and we've been getting our doctrine from the wrong folks Shandai you speak in tongues now E-D-D-I-E -E, that spells Eddie so uh, I believe that that when the church approximates apostolic lifestyle it will appropriate apostolic power are you with me here it's another message for another time and tonight i want to share with you out of the book of exodus the fourth chapter i'm going to try not to be long we will let you because we know there's school and and work and all other kind of things but i, I really I want to share with you the word of the Lord. Exodus 4. Exodus is actually a Greek translation of the Hebrew word. It means ek out, hodos, road, a road out of, an escape path. The Exodus is an escape path in the Greek. The fourth chapter, beginning in the 18th verse. We'll read verses 18 through verses 26. Verses 18 through verses 26. Herein is the beginning of the reading of God's word. And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt and see whether they be yet alive and Jethro said to Moses go in peace and the Lord said unto Moses and Midian go return into Egypt for all the men are dead which sought thy life and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of Egypt and Moses took the rod of God in his hand 
And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. We'll draw our text from the 24th verse. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, cast it at his feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Glory be to the Lord of the prophets. May his mercy be upon us forever. Verse 24 again. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Look at your neighbor and repeat my subject after me. Say, neighbor, help me. I think God is trying to kill me. I want to preach tonight from the subject, I think God is trying to kill me. Exodus, the fourth chapter, in most scholars' minds, if we deal with Talmud, Midrash, which are the commentaries on the Old Testament, um, we even deal with the earlier commentaries by Jerome and Origen, uh, as well as Gregory of Nyssa, who wrote many commentaries on the Old Testament. There somehow seems to be a conspiracy of silence about the 24th verse. The reason is, is that it does not fit here. This text is so obscure that early rabbis debated its authenticity and whether it belonged in the text at all. You have to understand the seriousness of this text. God has just commissioned Moses. He has just told Moses what he wants Moses to do. He has given Moses the commission of his ministry. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And the next verse says that while Moses is sleeping in a hotel, the, the same God that just told him, go set my people free, is trying to take him out. No warning. No prophecy. No dream. No vision. Nothing. Save the commission and then the attempted assassination. And it is the Lord that seeks to kill him. Let me say this to you. If you have never felt like God was trying to kill you, keep living. If you have never had to deal with the conflict of faith, the question of why you do everything right and seems like stuff still going wrong. Why, if the enemy is not able to come nigh thy dwelling, then why is God allowing series of events to take place to folks that are already struggling and doing the best they can? Seem like you would say, can I buy a break, rent a break? Can I get a vowel? Can you vote me off your island? Can I? Something. 
It would be instructive for us before we deal with this text and leave it to me. I'm the kind of preacher. What I do is I spend a lifetime looking for verses that nobody else preaches from to preach from. And that's my whole life's journey. It would be instructive for us before we deal with the fourth chapter to go back and find what brings Moses to this place. We find that the Bible says that there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. This Pharaoh begins to afflict the children of Israel because he is afraid of their numbers. And the Bible says that the more he afflicts them, the more they, mu they multiply and grow. Which lets me know that there is an inherent quality in the life of the believer that God's people work their best at their worst. Now I know that you would like it to be different than that, but that's just the truth. The best qualities in your life are revealed when you are going through your worst tribulation. And your greatest revelation of destiny and purpose are not in the successes in your life, it is in the tragedies in your life. And if you look back over your life and look at all of the mistakes and the stuff that went wrong, you will realize that the person that you are today is the secondary consequence of all the stuff that went wrong yesterday. And some of you need to send a fruit basket tonight when you leave here. You need to send a fruit basket to that boss that fired you from your little nickel dime job. And you were mad and angry at him. But you'd still be flipping burgers. You'd still be cleaning floors someplace had he not fired you. And you didn't even know your potential. You'd still be connected to some loser, some nobody. Had that person not walked out of your life and said, you ain't going to be nothing without me. You need to send them a flower bouquet and say, let me just thank you for leaving me. Because I didn't have the strength to leave you but I didn't know how dysfunctional I was till you got out of my life and finally my destiny could be revealed I love my enemies because every time they attack me they push me into a place with God that I didn't even know I was capable of I have looked at other people and I have said in my life, I don't know how they deal with it. I don't know how they go through it. I couldn't go through that. If it was me, I wouldn't be as kind as they are. I wouldn't be able to deal with it and then find myself going through it. And God says, Veron, you sold yourself short. You had power you didn't know you had. You had strength you didn't know you had. You had an anointing you didn't know you had. And the crisis revealed the strength you didn't know you had. The Bible says that the more he afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And by the sheer, by their sheer numbers, he now has issued an edict to the midwives of Israel or the midwives of the Hebrews to kill their firstborn sons. The Bible says that the midwives refused to do it. I won't deal with all of the complexities there, but the midwives are not Jews they are not Hebrews they are probably another nation that was enslaved and they served the Hebrew women which is unique because it implies then that they are not covenant people but they sacrificed or they they were instrumental in accomplishing the purpose of God in the life of those that are covenant let me say this as a footnote to you real quickly. Some of you will never be blessed because your theology is so black and white that you will never receive the purpose of God because you think God is only going to bless you through folks speaking in tongues and coming to church with their dress dragging the ground. And I'm here to tell you that God has some folks that ain't saved, are not spirit-filled, but they got your money and you ain't gonna receive it because you are too deep and too spiritual to be able to relate to them and to be able to connect to them where they are I have found out that I have to be able to meet people wherever they are and everyone that I'm meeting is not going to be brought into the kingdom but even if they don't come into the kingdom I can sure bring their money in the kingdom if you don't want to come at least send some of your money I don't have time to deal with that, but, but we have a new tape on uh, 
uh, I didn't bring any product, but on our, our website, archbishopash.com, I have a new uh, tape series called um, uh, God's Got a Hookup for You. And I deal with the widow of Zarephath, and we deal with the issue of, of unsaved people being connected to the saved to get them where God wants them to be. That's another message for another time. That's my little commercial. Take it while you get it. Listen here. So anyways, the Bible says that the midwives refused to do it. So Pharaoh issues an edict to all of the Egyptians to now murder, to slay all of the Hebrew children. And the scripture records to us this Holocaust. Not dozens, but millions, some scholars argue. At least in the hundreds of thousands, we know. That there are hundreds of thousands of children that are being slaughtered. And the Bible records, as well as historians, that when they were slaughtered, they were thrown into the Nile River. Many of the children were drowned in the Nile River. The Nile River became the source of their destruction. And in the midst of all of this murdering of innocent children, all because Pharaoh was afraid of their numbers. Not because they were intimidated, not because they wanted to destroy him, not because they hated him, not because they even intended to take over his kingdom. Let me say something to you. Most of your enemies will have no justifiable reason for not liking you. So you need to stop tripping over trying to figure out why they don't like you and worrying and trying, what did I do? What's wrong with me? Well, some folks just going to hate you because the hand of God is on you for no other reason. And there's nothing you can do about it that's going to make them like you. So you just going to have to get comfortable with being what God wants you to be and knowing that everybody that comes in your life is not going to like you. The Bible says that now the children of, 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 of the Hebrews are being killed, they're being slaughtered, and one woman discerns that her child is different from others. Because in every person's lives, there are battles that will be lost and battles that will be won. Contrary to what is popularly preached, you will lose some fights. And all fights are not worth fighting. Are you with me here? Even David didn't fight Goliath until the, he asked, what do I get? What shall be done to the man that slays this giant? David even understood. I ain't put my life on the line for nothing. <laughs> Tell me what the pay is. And a lot of us spend a lifetime fighting battles that produce nothing for ourselves. This woman discerned, and this is unique because other women have lost their children. Other women, children have been murdered. Why did she feel different? Let me say this to you. Sometimes you will lose some battles in your life. And, you, and it suffices to say, I succeeded here, I failed here. That's life. It happens. But there are some times in your life when the enemy attacks a certain part of your life and the Holy Spirit says, don't let this fail. This above all things, you cannot let this die. I know some other things in your life, some other aspects of your vision, some other aspects of your ministry uh, it didn't work out the way you thought they were going to work, didn't work out the way you were planning them to work. But, but this, this you cannot let die. And whatever it takes, you must sustain this because this is connected to your ultimate destiny. And you have to be able to discern whether you are just fighting a battle or whether you are dealing with something that will sustain you in the future. The Bible says that she discerns that what she is pregnant with is different than what anyone else is pregnant with. And she makes an ark, places the child in the ark, gives it to his sister. This child is Moses. Now listen to me here. Because you will find in the life of Moses a list of nameless obscure women who bring him into his destiny who are designed to get him to where God wants him to be. That's another message for women's conference. Because Moses would have never accomplished anything had it not been, and you'll see through the entire life of Moses, that there was nothing special that happened in the first, the first uh, quadrant of his life that was not directly inspired or dealt with by women. 
she spares his life she says they don't kill him gives it to her sister to her daughter and her daughter takes moses watch this in a reeded ark and places it in the nile river the current takes moses down the river into the hands of pharaoh's daughter now i want you to understand that this is the same nile river that was used to drown other babies this is the same nile river that other children were laying dead in this is the same nile river that was used to murder the innocent and what kills others will deliver you into the hands of your destiny the Nile was used to murder others, but a person of destiny was used to deliver him into the hands of his blessing, into the hands of his person. I'm here to tell you, you can look at other folks and say, my God, she went through that and backslid. He went through that and, and, and gave up. She went through that and committed suicide. I'm here to tell you, that's not going to happen to you. They may have went through that, but what caused them to lose it is going to cause you to succeed. What caused them to backslide is going to cause you to come stronger. What caused them to give up is going to cause you to have have more hope in the kingdom of God and the Bible says that Pharaoh's daughter snatched him out of the water and adopted him she made him heir to Pharaoh brought him into the kingdom called him her own son now he is the grandson of Pharaoh watch but she does not raise him she places him back in the hands of his sister who places him back in the hands of his mother you're not hearing me there's a spiritual truth there the first thing this first spiritual truth is god will never trust you with what you are incapable of letting go of i'll say that again god will never trust you with what you are incapable of letting go of this is why sacrificial giving is fault but it is the greatest key to destiny and purpose because the truth is what most of us need is money because money answers all things that's the book and the reason God challenges us with releasing it is because he is incapable of placing anything in our hand that we have not first released from our hand you believe in God for millions and you struggling with 20 are you with me here Moses his mother loved him so much that she was willing to let him go and let someone else raise him to sustain his life you hear me any successful ministry any successful business any successful calling any successful anointing will always risk its primary vision to invest it in the vision of another in other words you may join this church and you may come here a licensed minister you may come here an ordained elder from another church I'm here to tell you that when you walk in here you may have had a dream that you were gonna preach the thousands you may have had a vision you were gonna pastor a church when you join this church you're supposed to take that vision and sacrifice it kill it do away with it and sow it into their life and say I don't want it I'll, so, I'll make them get a thousand members. I'll make their church succeed. And if you release it and sow it into their ministry, God will trust you with it back. But if you can't let go of it, if you spend your whole time saying, I came here anointed, baby. I was preaching before I got here. I was pastoring before I was up under his apostolic covenant. And now he ain't going to let me preach at the conference. Well, let me prophesy to you tonight. You ain't going to become nothing, no way because if you have a grain of wheat it abides alone but if it dies and is planted it produces much fruit you may have a vision 
or a destiny but it abides by itself but if you take your destiny and kill it and plant it in another man's life then God will produce much fruit that he can prosper and you can prosper and I can prosper and the dimension of the kingdom will multiply beyond what we have perceived in the past I'd rather be the assistant pastor of a church with 10,000 than a pastor of a church with 12 So, Moses is returned to his mother. Why? Two reasons. We know today from child psychology that the first two years of a child's life are what, what is called the formative years. We have learned today that most dysfunction in people's lives goes back to them not gaining the necessary skills in the first two years of their life we neglect children in that era but notice that God did not let Pharaoh's daughter spend the first two years of raising Moses God did not let Pharaoh's daughter whisper in Moses' ear the mythology of Anut and Osiris and, and, and Isis and Anubis and all of the Egyptian mythology instead he was placed back in the hands of his mother so he wasn't not he, he never heard how the Anut ascended out of the dark abyss and that he breathed and when he breathed Ra woke up and when Ra woke up he spread his wings and the brilliant effulgence of the spreading of his wings ignited the flames of the heaven and it was became the sun but the sun was simply Ra riding across the riding across the stratospheres to meet his love Isis who he would mate with and cohabitate with and their children would give birth to the seasons that's what other Egyptian children were learning but while Moses though he was an Egyptian by adoption he was in his mother's ears arms and he was hearing didn't know Ra ride across an old desert and didn't know Anubis come up out of no abyss but 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 the Lord said let there be and there was she began to tell him Shema Yisrael Adonai Lechenu Adonai Echad Baruch Hashem Ata Adonai Adonai Et Abraham Adonai Et Yisach Adonai Et Yachob Oh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac. And he is the God of Jacob. He was being educated. Couldn't even speak. But he was hearing the mystery. And after two years, he was placed back in the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. Now he is raised with all of the vast provision of the Egyptian schools. Egypt at this time is the greatest nation to ever have been on the face of the earth. Egypt had conquered the 70 nations of the earth at that time in its proximity. Moses then had mastered the 70 languages of the 70 conquered people. They had the first written system that was as complex as it was. Even though Sanskrit is an earlier writing and an earlier written alphabet, hieroglyphics was far more profound and complicated. He had mastered the hieroglyphics of the Egyptians. He had studied architecture. He had studied astronomy. He had studied medicine. He had studied all of the things that made the Egyptians great. He had studied irrigation. He had studied the times and the seasons. All of these things were availed to him because he was going to one day be a pharaoh. He was being trained to be a god. Because a pharaoh was a veritable deity. A demigod in the ranks of Egypt. So Moses had all of this available to him and for 
30 years of his life, Moses begins to train and learn and become all that Moses can be. For 30 years, Moses realizes who he is, finds out what he's capable of, finds out how smart he is, how intelligent he is, learns it, masters it, conquers it, and, 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 and fulfills all of the obligations that are requisite for the grandson of a pharaoh. And one day while walking through the field, he began to survey the vast treasures of the cities that belonged to his grandfather. And while surveying them, he saw an Egyptian taskmaster abusing a Hebrew slave. Now understand this. He's not a Hebrew. As far as he knows. He is an Egyptian. But there was something his mama put down on the inside that all the education and all the training and all the other stuff couldn't get rid of so that when Moses walked up on the taskmaster abusing this Hebrew slave the Bible says he ran up killed the taskmaster and buried him two things happen whenever there's a crisis in your life hear me whenever there's a crisis in your life a crisis comes to reveal two things it comes to reveal your virtue and your vice your strength and your weakness this event reveals two things about Moses one that Moses inherently is gifted to become a deliverer of the oppressed the second thing it reveals about Moses's character is that he cannot control his anger oh you're not hearing me because not only did he kill the taskmaster but he buried him he tried to hide the situation he could have stopped the abuse without murder and you will see in Moses's future that his inability to control his anger cost him the kingdom so that you need leaders in your life who do not only discern your strengths but also will sit you down and tell you what's wrong with you every one of us needs somebody to sit us down and say yes you're gifted but you ain't ready yes you're anointed but you're too fast yes God's gonna use you but you're too lustful you're too greedy and you need someone that can speak frankly into your life and reveal what's wrong with you so that you do not miss the kingdom when it's all over and we look for leaders that pat us on the back build us up tell us what a wonder we are but we don't look for leaders that identify the issues in our life that will keep us from becoming what God wants us to become Listen to me here. I'm almost finished with chapter one. Sorry, chapter two. Moses murders him and the Bible says that the next day two Hebrew men are arguing. Moses stops them from quarreling and they say, will you also slay us as you did the Egyptian? Busted. Moses was busted. The information had gotten out and news came to him how that Pharaoh had sent his guards to find Moses Moses the prince now is Moses the fugitive because Moses now must leave the safety of the treasured cities of Pharaoh and has to learn to live in the desert hear me because before anyone can do business with God they must first go to the desert no man or woman can ever be used by God and not deal with the desert experience of their life before Jesus who was the Theanthropos the God man could be trusted with the anointing from heaven the Holy Ghost led him 
into the desert before Paul started his earthly ministry he was driven into the deserts of Arabia before John received his revelation he was driven to the desolate Isle of Paranus and before God will use you he will drive you into the vast deserted wasteland called the desert the desert is a place where nothing grows and no one lives the desert teaches you two things it teaches you how to deal with the times in your life when there is no obvious growth There is nothing more frustrating than loving God and feeling like you ain't getting nowhere. And the truth is that most of us play the game good. We all act like we're Holy Ghost, Wonder Woman, and Supernatural Superman, and God's first cousin, and the prayer wheel's always turning, and the fire's always burning, and we don't have no problems. But the truth is, some of us have to, des and we, we put on a good front because we don't want nobody to know we're going through. So we know, we know how to say, praise the Lord, pray, man, how you doing, praise God, praise the Lord, baby, pray, praise the Lord. You, how you doing, you know, I'm blessed and highly favored, praise God. We know how to throw up our hands when it's time. We know how to shout, we know how to respond emotionally. We know how to go through all of the things, but some of us will be truthful. We say, Bishop, Ash, there are times in my life when I feel like I have gotten stuck in a rut. And I pray, but I'm not getting an answer. And, and, and I read the word, but I'm not understanding it and the, the closer I get the farther I feel and the more I learn about him the less I know about him and, and I'm dealing with I, I, I can't confess it I, I don't want to tell anyone because I don't want them to think I'm backsliding because, because I'm looking at my life and I'm not sinning but I'm not growing and, 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 and I'm not backsliding but, 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 but I'm stuck the desert is a place where nothing grows it teaches us that there are times in our life that you will feel like you are not growing there are times in your life where you will feel like you are stuck there are times in your life where you will feel like nothing is taking place and then you must learn to be consistent just like there are times in a wife's life that she does not feel like being a wife but she continues to be a, and there are times in a husband's life that he does not feel like being a husband and there are times in parents life they don't feel like being parents but they got to get up and they got to cook and they got to clean and they got to do all of those things because they find out that there are times you enjoy it there are times you celebrate it but most of your life is simply doing the work of, 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 of the, that is associated with your title you will find out quickly that 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 that, that, that most of your life is simply doing the same thing over and over and there's not a lot of excitement in getting up in the morning getting dressed getting in the car going to work taking care of business coming back home going back to having dinner watching the same tv program going to church get dressed go back go home pick it up turn around this that that it's the same stuff over and over it's that same thing and unless you find god in it you will begin to feel like you're losing your mind and god wants to let you know i'm in there i'm i know it's monotonous but see what consistency teaches you what monotony teaches you is consistency and consistency is the greatest talent and gift that God could ever give a person because it teaches us to be faithful because let me say this to you the anointed don't get rewarded get quiet if you want to I believe in the anointing I'm anointed I want the anointing I ask God for the anointing but I'll tell you something I ain't impressed with the anointing you heard it here folks my last night I might as well go for broke I'm not impressed with the anointing because he never said enter thou in thou good and anointed servant he said enter thou in thou good and faithful servant and the problem with people who are anointed is they always need it to be new and fresh and you got to put on a good show and it's got to be exciting but you know what I found out I found out that a lot of the stuff in the kingdom of God is just day-to-day -day living it's normal it's not supernatural it's not fire from heaven it's not light shining from heaven it's just living right it's paying your bills it's paying your tithes it's loving it's being faithful it's struggling to live holy it's trying to keep your prayer life it's opening the word of God it's not always exciting it's not always fire burning it's not always fire from heaven but it's the thing that keeps us in the kingdom and people that always want fireworks and stuff like that those people are unstable faithful people let me say this anointed people are very rarely faithful faithful people will always be anointed but anointed people are very rarely faithful 
You hire an anointed person to do something and they will only be there for the check. That's why I told, I was at a conference recently and I told someone, I said, you know what? Let me tell you something. I have a real issue with armor bearers. I'm sick of them. I don't like them. I don't want them. See, first of all, I'm not a punk. I can carry my own briefcase. I can open my own car. I don't need a lackey. Because when I read the scripture, when the war came, the armor bearers fled. Who was bringing news that Saul was dead? Saul's armor bearer. You my armor bearer, Booger, you supposed to go down first. I don't want armor bearers. I carry my own armor. I want sons. I want sons. And the difference is that armor bearers are oftentimes hirelings. See, hirelings work for a check. Sons work for an inheritance. Hirelings work for a title, but sons work for a name. You're not hearing me by the Holy Ghost. And, and what I found is that oftentimes armor bearers and people that do not really consider themselves spiritual sons, they will spend more time trying to find out who my tailor is. They will spend more time trying to find out where I eat and what I, how, all the, find out the nuances of, of my minute. But they're not really finding the spirit. See, you don't need to know who makes my suits. You need to be asking me, how do I pray to get a message? You don't need to ask me what kind of interest rate I got on my Mercedes. You need to ask me, what kind of prayer life do I have that sustains me in the midst of trouble? I'm going to preach in just a minute. And most things in the kingdom of God are just normal. Consistency. Oh, consistency, thou art a Jew. Let me say something to you. Do you know how the walls fell at Jericho? They kept walking. They just kept walking. You want to overcome the devil? Your greatest weapon, just keep walking. Your greatest weapon is not you falling on the ground, rolling down the street, throwing all or hang, waving a handkerchief. It's telling the devil, you know what, you can fight me, but baby, I'm going to keep walking. Mess with my family, but I'm going to keep walking. Take my money, but I'm going to keep walking. Take my, my, my ministry, but I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep walking till the wall falls. I'm going to keep walking till the anointing comes. I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to do. It don't seem supernatural, but it's more supernatural than you will ever know. Because most folk give up walking and they lay down by the road to die. But those of you that can keep walking, you may be limping but walking. And you keep walking till God gives you the victory he promised you. I'm finishing, I'm finishing. I'll let you go in 15 minutes. He is driven into the desert because the desert is a place where nothing grows. Secondary thing, hear me. Not only does nothing grow there, but nobody lives there. No person can do business with God until he has mastered the monster called loneliness it is the secret enemy of every preacher of every evangelist and man and woman of God it is the one thing we don't speak about because we don't want to admit our human frailty but if you are going to be anointed, 
you are going to be lonely you will be married and be lonely because there are some things that you can't share and they won't understand she can be anointed he can be anointed but there's some things that when they say baby can i yeah uh, this is just, just me and god we got to work this thing out there's some stuff even the person you're married to does not have access to every aspect of the dimension of your soul you can be in a crowd with twenty thousand folks and still be lonely you can be surrounded by staff and struggle with the issue that no one understands the depth of the message and the vision you're wrestling with you you can be surrounded by peers who you think understand but when it comes down to it they don't understand what God has spoken to you so that oftentimes men and women of God wrestle with the issue that in their own city and in their own town they have no one to fellowship with they drive home they go to church they pick up the phone they say praise the Lord they may have a lunch but they have no one they can pour their heart out to and share the deep dimensions of their soul so God says before I bring you into ministry and loneliness destroys you you got to conquer loneliness in the desert and some of you you'll never be used by God because you need the approval and approbation of people You will find that oftentimes to be on God's side, you will have to lose the favor of the people. And when you stand for right, you'll find you'll be standing alone. It is frustrating. The desert teaches you how to deal with loneliness. The desert teaches you how to become totally dependent on God. Moses is driven into the desert. Watch, I'm gonna get, we're going to kill him in a moment. Watch, hold on. We're going to try. After being in the desert for a period of time, he encounters Jethro. Jethro brings him into the family. Jethro is a Midian priest. Jethro now tells Moses, take care of my sheep. You will be a shepherd. Now you have to understand that sheep are an abomination to Egyptians. Of all animals, the sheep are the most unclean in the Egyptian mind. So now Moses, who was raised as an Egyptian, finds himself pastoring something he was trained to despise. Hear me. Because before God can release you in your ministry, he's going to have to deal with all your little pet peeves. And you're going to find all the stuff you don't like. You're going to have to confront it. Because in ministry, you don't have the luxury of options. Oh, you can get quiet if you want to. In ministry, you don't have the luxury of doing what you like. Moses had to take care of sheep. Why? Because God was seeing if he could take care of sheep, he could take care of my people. Your primary call determines your prophetic call. Hear me. In every person's life, there is a prophetic call and there is a primary call. Whether or not you will fulfill your prophetic call is determined by whether or not you have learned your primary call. You're not hearing me. If you despise where you are now, God will never trust you with where you're supposed to be tomorrow. Watch this. Let me give you an example. This is, real, this is so simple. You need somebody to help you misunderstand. Watch this. Mr. Masagi. Wax on. Wax off. 
Grab his arm. Grab his arm. The little skinny white boy mad. He, I joined karate school. Why am I waxing? He's mad. He's despising him. And finally, his spiritual mentor, or his karate mentor, says, you think you wax in cars. But come here. And he punches him and he does a little wax off and his wax on and he realizes I wasn't learning to wax cars I was learning a discipline of defense had I despised the waxing of the car I never would have become a champion in karate are you listening to me here and many of you are doing things now but you're despising them but you don't realize what you're doing now is preparing you for what you're supposed to do tomorrow you can't own your own business and you ain't never work for nobody else you don't deserve to own a house and your apartment is nasty with roaches and stuff ain't clean And when you're faithful over what belongs to someone else, then God will become and give you rulership over what belongs to you. And what you're doing now will determine what you're doing tomorrow. You can get quiet if you want to. We're going home. Watch. I'm almost finished. He takes care of the sheep. Jethro offers sacrifice at the foot of the mountain. Moses becomes curious, goes up into the mountain. He gets up into the mountain. A voice, he sees a bush on fire but not consumed. The voice from the bush speaks to Moses and says, Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Now, the taking off of one's shoes in the Semitic culture, both Egyptian and Midian, is not a sacred action. It is not a liturgical action. In other words, we think that you're supposed to take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy. No. Priests always had their feet covered. The only people that took off their shoes were warriors. Because when they fight, they need to be able to dig, when you're wrestling, dig your feet into the sand so that you can have some leverage. So when God said, take your shoes off, he was telling Moses, for the last 30 years, Booger, you learned all you could be in Egypt. But now you and I, gonna tussle and you gonna find out who I am you didn't come up into this mountain just to see what was going on we gonna fight and when you leave this mountain you walking out of here knowing who I am are you listening to me God was telling Moses I'm going to reveal my credentials and we gonna fight till you know who I am and who you ain't hear me I'm almost finished listen he gets up there and God now gives Moses the commission I've heard the cry of my people they are oppressed go tell Pharaoh let my people go Moses says no now y'all don't act surprised <laughs> Moses says who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel certainly who am I? Moses denies. Now, first of all, understand this. There's a bush on fire, not consumed. There's a voice speaking to you, but you don't see nobody. Are you with me? It just told you to do something, and you are negotiating the contract. See, that upsets me. Because in the church I came up in, I didn't know you were allowed to say no. I didn't know we could say no. We were taught songs like, yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when the Spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer... 
will be yes. Lord, yes. Look like y'all went to the same church I went to. Pray the prayer. Obviously, Moses didn't take that Sunday school class. Because Moses said no. Understand this. Moses has said no. A second time God asks him. A second time Moses says no. Do you understand the complexity of what's taking place here? First of all, you let me ask you one time and you say no. Ain't gonna be no second time. Ain't gonna be no third time. You get one. God twice. Speak for me. Who am I? I'm nobody. Second time. Speak for me. Who shall I say sent me? Now Moses ain't no dummy. Moses understands he has encountered a divine being. He does not understand the immensity of the being. But he does know from studying theology in Egypt. That if you could get a God's name, you could control the God. By knowing their name, you can evoke them and invoke them. You use their name and they come. You use their name and they leave. You use their name and blessings are released. You use their name and cursings are released. So Moses says, he's playing a little mind games. He said, well, if I went... Who would I say sent me? And God says, tell him, Echier, Asher, Echier sent you. It is translated, I am that I am. Improper. In the Hebrew, it suggests, I have always been, therefore I will always be. God was not actually giving Moses his name. He was giving Moses his nature. He says, you think if you get my name, I'm going to come when you call me. But I need you to know that before you call me, I'm here. And when you get up this mountain, I'll be here. And when you go down into Midian, I'll be there. Because I am here and I have always been here and I will always be here. I am Echier Echer Asher Echier in the Hebrew. I have been, therefore I will always be. In the Greek Septuagint, it is translated uh, Pantokrater. He who was and is and is to come. So it is not so much a revelation of his name as it is a revelation of his nature. Because this is not the Tetragrammaton. This is not the yad he vav he where we take the vowels from Adonai, try to put them, superimpose them over yad he vav he which are the consonants, and we get the enunciation Yahweh. This was not the revelation of that name. This is the revelation of Echyed Asher Echyed. This says, I have always been, therefore I will always be. What are you saying, Bishop? This is why when Moses experienced God, because God is in all times at the same time, when he reveals his name, Moses, the Bible says, saw the backside of God. You ever said that, saw that in the scripture? That Moses saw the backside? Well, by seeing the backside of God, what did he see? He didn't see the backside of God because God don't have a backside. God is not flesh and blood. God don't have, there's nothing behind it. But when he saw the backside of God, because God is an eternal being, he saw the past. That's why Moses could write the book of Genesis in the first person, even though he wasn't there. And when he saw the backside of God, he said, in the beginning. Beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face because when he saw the back he saw the past oh you're not listening to me you're not listening to me you're not listening to me I have a friend of mine who is a scholar he argued with me he told me something I said Bishop he said Bishop Ash he said you, you seem to be a very very fairly intelligent person I said thank you I, I appreciate that he said, you've, 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 you've mastered the nuances of, of the, the biblical languages. Uh, you, have, uh, you, you have had the benefit of academia. You are, in some circles, considered a patristic scholar. Um, I don't understand how someone with the intellectual capacity that you have actually believes the Bible to be a literal, authentic text. 
I said, I don't understand. What do you mean? He says, you're too smart to believe that this book is authentic. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, there's so many errors in it. I said, name one. He says, well, the book of Numbers says, and Moses died. If Moses wrote the book of Numbers, how could Moses say, and Moses died? Some of you say, well, I never thought of that, man. <laughs> Ain't that the devil, boy? I told him it's very simple. When Moses saw the backside of God, he saw the past. God said, to the prophets, I speak in dreams and visions. But to Moses, I speak face to face. So Moses saw God's face. So if the backside was the past, then the face was the future. Can you imagine how surprised Moses was when he was writing the book of Numbers and his hand got out of control and he wrote, and Moses died. Because he was God. Echid, Asher, Echid. I have been, therefore, I will always be. It was a revelation of nature. Moses, a second time, says no. A third time, God asks him. A third time, Moses says no. A fourth time, God asks him. A fourth time, Moses says, I have no power. God says, pick up the stick, turns to the snake. Put it back down, turns back to the stick. Put your hand in your bosom, come, turns leprosy. Put it back, it's normal again. There's power. A fourth time Moses says no. Now y'all don't understand. This is God. Kill him. Get somebody else. But God is fighting with Moses. A fifth time. God says, do it. Fifth time Moses says no. And finally Moses submits after the fifth no. He says, in spite of my no, I will do what you have asked me to do. Watch. I asked God. I said, first of all, I'm mad because I didn't get to say no. So I'm a little upset. Because I didn't read the fine print. Why did you endure? his stubbornness why did you tolerate Moses' arrogance when you asked him to do it and he continued to say no God spoke to me and said Varan the reason that I fought with Moses is because I realized that if Moses would say no to me and I'm God how much more will he say no to the enemy when he stands in the presence of those that will defile the name of the living God? God said, first of all, Ron, I don't surround myself with yes men. Everyone I call said no. I called Jeremiah, he said no. Call Isaiah, he said no. Call Jonah, he said no. Call Mary, she said no. All of them said no. I choose people that say no. And I said, why? Because any yes that is easily offered is a valueless yes. What are you saying, Bishop Ash? You go out on a date with somebody one time, one time, and they telling you, baby, I love you. They are lying. They don't know you. They can't love you. You can't visit this church one Sunday and say, God sent me here to be under you and to serve you. You don't understand every aspect. That's why a lot of folks come and they're here one Sunday and then they're so excited. And then when they find out that redemptive life ain't about just shouting and singing and praising the Lord, that there's some commitment, then what they confessed on Sunday changes five months down the road. So you just cannot accept a yes that is easily offered because if it's easily offered, it is valueless. Are you with me? Every time Moses said no, he increased his worth. He became more valuable to God. Because he said, first of all, this ain't no punk. <laughs> Something else the dialogue revealed. God needed to know that Moses was humbled 
but not humiliated broken but not destroyed he needed to know that the desert accomplished what he wanted it to accomplish but did not go too far because there are some people who have been through so many trials and through so much suffering they don't have no backbone they've lost all will to fight they have no desire and they just come to church depressed oppressed possessed trying to confess uh -uh. because they've been so broken through and God says I needed to make sure that Moses could fall on his knees but I needed to make sure that he could jump back up and fight on my behalf are you with me I'm almost finished so God brought Moses and then then notice this not only was God testing Moses but Moses was testing God because notice that Moses did not say no three times notice that Moses did not say no seven times Moses said no five times and five is the number of grace and Moses had served the Egyptian gods and knew that they did not know what grace was and he said if I'm gonna serve this God I need to know that he is capable of granting to me favor in spite of my mess that he will love me in spite of me are you listening to me I'm almost through I'm finishing for real now Moses comes out of the mountain and I want you to catch this here and here's where we get to the 18th verse I said all of that to say this and Moses returned from the mountain and went to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto Jethro let I let me go I pray thee and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt and see whether they be yet alive now I want you to catch this revelation here. I want you to catch this. Moses just spoke with God. The same God that Jethro served, but Jethro did not know. Moses did not come out of the mountain and tell Jethro, the Lord told me to go to Egypt. You're not getting that. Moses didn't come out of the mountain flaunting his spiritual experience acting like he was better than Jethro neither did he use his spiritual experience to make an excuse or to manipulate Jethro's decision with it Moses went to Jethro and said I pray let me go because Moses knew if this was really God see Jethro was the final test so that Moses could be sure he was not delusional see some of you because you had an experience with God we can't tell you nothing and there are folks in the church where I'm running, say, I don't care what the bishop says I know what God told me I don't care what my pastor says he went in my room when Jesus opened the door walked in sat down my bed and told me he's going he's a way maker you are delusional that experience is false some you ate the night before messed you up how do you know you don't know how you know because if he told you to do something then he would tell him what he told you and you wouldn't have to tell him what the Lord told you so he could tell you what the Lord told him we submit to earthly authority because we cannot trust our own mind because we are easily deceived especially prophetic people so you have to have men of integrity so that when you have a legitimate experience if God really called you to preach and has the anointing to empower you don't you think he can tell him he called you 
I'm here to tell you to your face if he didn't tell him he didn't tell you you are confused so just, just keep ushering and love the Lord I went to church in Miami, Florida. I went to Bethel Apostolic Temple, Mother Doris Aikens, 119th Street and 18th Avenue, in the hood. Way before that, we were on 22nd Avenue and 62nd Street, in the hood. Y'all don't know nothing about that. We're around the corner from Saint City Barbecue. But anyways, praise the Lord. And the Holy Spirit had called me to be a prophet called me to preach at a young age but I was a member of this church and I live in such fear a good fear and respect for my pastor and I never told her I never told her that God spoke to me I had a vision from the Lord and the Lord walked in my room it took me three days to get my speech back no, you, you, you people tell me, he, yeah, he, this morning he walked in my room, and you here to tell me about it? <laughs> it took me three days to gain my consciousness back. The experience was so overwhelming because the human body cannot, it's not made to endure that level of glory. It literally took me three days to experience it, and I told nobody because I thought I was crazy. I thought I had lost it. Something was wrong with me. And on Good Friday, Mother Aikens got up and chose seven people to preach the seven last sayings of Jesus. And she chose six of them out of the pulpit, ordained elders. And then she looked out in the audience at a little blonde headed 13 year old kid. And said, Brother Ash, you come up here. You're going to preach one of the last sayings of Jesus. That was my first sermon. I had never spoke to her. I had never talked to her. I had never been around her. But the Holy Spirit spoke to her and she pulled me out of obscurity into a place of prominence. I'd be sitting there today until God would tell her what he told me. Are you with me here? I wouldn't move without that confirmation here's Moses who experienced God and the first thing he did was he asked Jethro if he could do it I'm here to tell you that whatever God tells you to do do not embark on it except you have the blessing of your spiritual father because everything let me I'm gonna give you a quick school of the prophets I'm gonna give you an entire school of the prophets in 15 seconds you ready? I ain't even gonna charge you $150 like I usually do. This is free. Watch us. Entire school of the prophets. Trust the revelation at its purest. Trust the interpretation less than the revelation. Trust the application less than the interpretation. Trust the timing less than everything else. In other words, the revelation is always the purest form of what God said when you begin to miss what God said it is usually in the interpretation the further you miss it is when you try to apply what you interpreted about what was revealed and the worst mistakes are when you try to time what is applied what was interpreted about what was revealed most people miss it in time so we're not saying God didn't tell you but there are aspects about what God told you you don't know yes god may have told you you're called to preach but i know because i'm your pastor your life yes. i know your family situation i know your bill situation so i'm not denying the revelation but i am denying the timing you ain't ready you ain't ready because you ain't held a steady job for a year you ain't ready because your wife every month is struggling, worrying about how to pay the bills and you supposed to be the husband. 
you ain't ready because your kids wearing the same raggedy sneakers because you too lazy to work you ain't ready because your credit is messed up you ain't ready because you can't come to church on time and you leave early I'm not denying you ain't called I'm denying you ain't ready Oh, oh, gee. Now watch what happens, Jen. I'm finished with this. I'm finished with this. I'm finished. I'm finished. Is this good? This is, this is all right? This is all... Tell someone and say, sound doctor. This is sound doctor. Right. Now watch. Moses asked him this, and then notice what verse 19 says. And the Lord said to Moses, go return to Egypt. Tell all the... For all the men that are dead with salt. Right. Now watch what's taking place here. After Jethro releases him, he takes his wife and his sons and they leave the land of Egypt. They, they return to the land of Egypt. And the Lord says to Moses, when you return to Egypt, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do everything I showed you and tell him everything I told you. Here's the commission. On the series of events, everything's cool. Right? I mean, I want you to go preach, go tell them I'm going to deliver you, I'm going to deliver the children, and then I'm going to do all the miracles I told you I was going to do. Moses says, cool, I got it, down. Set the people free, work a couple miracles, call a fire to heaven, get them out of Egypt. I got it, I got it, I got it down. I'm going to go take a nap. And while Moses is sleeping, the same God that commissioned him now tries to kill him. Why? Next verse. So Zipporah took a stone and cut off the foreskin of her elder son. Threw it at the feet of Moses and said, Surely thou art a bloody husband. A bloody husband thou art to me because of the circumstances. Watch. Why was God going to kill Moses? Because even though Moses had a destiny, Moses was about to bring flesh into his destiny and God said I don't care how great your prophecy is I don't care how great your I don't care what I told you you're gonna do if you try to bring flesh into my prophecy if you try to bring flesh into my promise if you try to bring flesh into my vision in my dream then I'm gonna take you out you're not getting it and some of us think that the vision itself is enough it is not enough. Oh, you're quiet, you're quiet, you're quiet. I ain't gonna hoop tonight. We're just gonna, we gonna rock this right here. Watch this. Watch this. Here's the key. Moses should have known that his elder son should have been circumcised. And Moses, let me tell you circumcision is the, the reason circumcision, there's two things important about circumcision, why circumcision is so important. I asked God, I said, God, why did you make the covenant of circumcision with the children of Israel? Why the cutting away of flesh, the foreskin of the male reproductive organ? I mean, why couldn't they get a tattoo? <laughs> or like a funny haircut or something, you know, some. Why? Why that? First reason, we know gynecologists tell us today that men who are uncircumcised, have a lower probability of impregnating their wife. Why? Because excess skin or flesh, excess flesh hinders the seed from reaching the egg. It is a natural contraceptive. You're not hearing me. Excess flesh hinders pregnancy. You're not hearing me. Excess flesh hinders pregnancy. And God said, I made you a promise, but I can't get you pregnant with the promise because you got too much flesh in your life. Watch this. The second reason about circumcision. Why is circumcision so important? Why did God establish circumcision with the male reproductive organ? Because the male reproductive organ is not an instrument of sensuality. It is an instrument of procreation. Its primary purpose is to procreate. Watch. 
So he establishes the covenant at the place where the next generation begins. So every promise that God makes with you, he doesn't make it with you. He makes it with your sons and your sons' sons and your sons' sons. So God told Moses, you about to walk in the promised land, but you don't care about your own child. I'm, when I send the death angel, he's going to kill all the uncircumcised. And your child is uncircumcised. And you about to risk your child's life because you are so intent on fulfilling your destiny, you're forgetting about the next generation. And we're dealing with a generation of the church that is so consumed with themselves, their own ministry, their own anointing, but they ain't leaving nothing for the next generation. They're not concerned for those that are to come. That's why those of you that are part of redemptive life, every day of your life you need to pat your back because you don't have a pastor trying to be the next great evangelist or the next great preacher he's trying to empower people for the future it's not as successful it don't sell as many tapes it doesn't sell as many books it don't get you on tbn a lot but i'll tell you something your sons will thank you for attending this church your grandsons will thank you for attending this church because it is leaving a heritage for those generations that are to come I'm finished hear me hear me watch this I'm almost done what happens here circumcision God tells Moses I'm gonna kill you why because I'd rather you to die and not fulfill the promise than to fulfill the promise and not be able to partake of it because of flesh in your life at least if I kill you now I have lost nothing because you have not gained fame. But if I got to deal with flesh after you're on TBN, if I got to deal with flesh after you sold 10,000 tapes, if I got to deal with flesh after you're successful, then it's going to hurt the whole vision. So I'd rather kill you now. Oh, shy. Watch this. Now here's the question. Why didn't God warn him? God one minute is giving him promise. Next minute trying to take him out. Why? I asked God, I said, why didn't you warn him? God spoke to me and said, Veron, there's some stuff I ought not have to tell my people. Amen. Moses was about to start his ministry. I ought not, you ought not have to tell someone preaching keep your pants up and your dress down <laughs> ought not have to tell someone been in the church 20 years you need to tithe and see some of you God ain't even sending a warning he's just gonna start cursing and killing and the reason he ain't sending a warning is because you should know better because you've been here long enough I'm finished I'm finished I'm finished there's another evangelist coming next week. Some, they make you shout next week. Watch. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. It does not matter how great your destiny is. God will not allow you to fulfill it with flesh present. Say that again. It does not matter how great your destiny is. God will not allow you to fulfill it with flesh present. Hear me. Now let me say this. This is not only a katobo shatai. This has nothing to do with sin. His son not being circumcised was not an issue of sin. It was an issue of covenant. You're missing it. It was an issue of a vow. See, some of you think because you ain't horn around or sleeping around. You ain't lying, and you ain't cussing, you ain't drinking, you ain't sipping and tipping. You got it together. Harry, let me get, I, got, I got a little word for you. This wasn't an issue of sin. This was an issue of a broken promise. The promise was that every firstborn son, every son would be circumcised on the eighth day. See, let me tell you, some of you, you haven't sinned. But when you got saved, you promised God you'd pray an hour every day. 
You promised God you'd read the Bible every day. You promised God you'd fast once a week. You promised God that you'd never miss church. You promised God that you would be a faithful tither and a giver. And it's not that you've sinned, but your vow has been broken. Your covenant with God has, you lost your prayer life. You lost your dedication. You lost your hunger for the word. You lost your passion for the house of God. You lost your respect for the men and the women of God. And it's not an issue of sin. It's an issue of broken covenant. Years ago, the old mothers in the church used to sing a song. I made a vow to the Lord and I won't take it back. And all we need this generation today to come to the place that they say, I made a promise and I won't take it back. I'm going to keep my prayer life. I'm getting my prayer life back. I'm getting my fasting life back. I'm getting my anointing back. I'm getting my desire for the word of God back. I refuse to let God kill me. I'm not going to die because I broke my covenant. I will fulfill the promise of the Lord. Standing on your feet all over this place. I'm finished. Hear me. Hear me. This is not an issue of sin. This is an issue of covenant. If Moses, who God entrusted the deliverance of his most prized possession, the children of Israel, through whom the Messiah would come and the kingdom would be established, if Moses was not exempt from examination and judgment, then what makes you think you are exempt? Notice who it was who grabbed, who, 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 who cut off the foreskin. It was Zipporah, his wife. Hello, church. The life of the church is not to come to make you just shout. It is to identify the thing of flesh in your life. The excess flesh. The stuff that is hindering you from fulfilling the purpose and plan and mandate of God. Moses almost missed his destiny. God was trying to kill him just like God trying to kill some of you. And he's not trying to kill you because you sinned. He's trying to kill you because... It's been a long time since you picked up the word. It's been a long time since you prayed. I mean, really pray. I'm not talking about driving to work late, 70 miles an hour to my Lord, I thank you. It's been a long time since you turned your plate down and really fasted. This house would go on fast and you would break it. And you, 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 were, you had excuse. Well, I have to work. And I'm tired. And I'm on, you know. I'm getting old. I miss the purpose of God. You can't be a member of an apostolic prophetic church like this and God not put a demand on your life. The demand in an apostolic prophetic church is greater than any other church because what God wants to do through you is greater than what God wants to do through other churches. You are not called to gather people. You are called to send people out. Other churches trying to get folks and apostolic churches are trying to distribute the, the message, the ministry, the purpose of God. And God is saying, listen, it's not that you don't have a destiny. You have a destiny. You have a purpose. You have a plan. You just broke your promise. You promised you'd pray every day and you haven't prayed every day. You promised you'd meet me in the morning, but you don't meet me in the morning anymore. You promised you'd fast once a week. You ain't missed a meal in three years. You promised me that you would read my word. And you watch more TV than you do my word. You promised you'd be faithful to the church. But you make excuse after excuse after excuse why you can't come. You promised you would be a faithful tither and giver. And yet you tithe when it is convenient. And when times are tight, it is the Lord that is asked to take the lack, not visa. Are you with me here? The truth is, 
And I ain't asking you to embarrass yourself tonight, but the truth is that many of us have broken our vows to the Lord. And we're standing here and we're saying, listen, it's not that I don't love the Lord, I love Him. But I have not been praying the way that I should, and I have not been fasting, and I have not been reading, and I have not been seeking, and I have not been fulfilling the purpose of God. And the truth is, and the reason that I have not been doing these things is because there is stuff in my life that is taking my time. And when I really begin to look at the stuff that's in my life, I realize it's all flesh. I realize that I can turn the TV off and I realize that a lot of these extracurricular activities are good for the flesh but not for the spirit. They're not pursuing or fulfilling any mandate upon my spiritual life. And what God is calling you to do tonight, and it's not going to be long, I'm going to count to three. And right where you are when I hit that number three, if this message ministered to you and you said, Lord, there are issues in my life, there's excess flesh in my life, but I want God to visit me. When I count to three, I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar. But I'm going to ask you right where you are to throw your hands up and cry out to the Lord. Don't play no games. Don't be cute. Don't be dignified. But tell God, God, circumcise my heart. Cut away everything that's not like you. Don't let me die in this condition. Don't leave me here another day. I want my anointing back. I want my dedication back. I want my prayer life back. I want my consecration back. I want my prayer. I want it back. And if you cry out tonight, it ain't going to take long. The Holy Ghost will visit you. And he will release the promise of God. On the count of three. One, two, three. Cry out. Give me back my dedication. Give me back my prayer life. Give me back my consecration. Give me back my longing for your word. Give me back my longing for your house. Oh God, I want to be real. I want to be real. I want to be real. I want your anointing in the name of Jesus. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Take it away. Anything that's not like you, take it away. Take away my selfish desires, my hidden agendas. Circumcise my heart. Cut away my flesh. In the name of Jesus, katana la la bosheta, in the name of Setebe kita la bahata, ronde lebe kishanda la la masete. You're worthy. Oh, yala bashanda, take it away. Whatever it is, take it away. Whatever it is, take it away. Take it away. Deliver, 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 deliver. In the name of Jesus, deliver your people. Do it now. Hear my cry, oh God. Attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, Yalaba Santa. Ida la 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 bosanta. Reket nele de yo shande. Oh, God. Yalaba Santa. Give me back my prayer life. Give me back my anointing, my dedication, my consecration, whatever it is the devil stole. I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You said that if any man asks anything in your name according to your will, you hear us. And if you hear us, you will perform the thing that we have asked. 
Tonight we do not come with selfish ambition or hidden agenda. Hear the sincere cry of a people that have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church tonight. I've come to this house as a prophet tonight to declare thy word that you may remove our flesh. Hear our cry. Where we are lacking, give us grace. Where there is excess flesh, send the skilled scalpel of your word to cut away everything that's not like you. Everything that is in our life that is not necessary, remove it. Everything in our life that is taking us away from you, that is distracting us, take it. Whatever is distracting us from you, take it. We give you free reign. You are the air we breathe. We desire you. You desire you. Oh God. Oh God. I'm lost without you. I can't live without you. Oh God. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Oh Basha. I feel deliverance. Yeah. <laughs> Oh mama baba 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 shake in the la 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 shata ne le 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 sete shaka na 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 sete le 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 he he go ba shata oh shaman sa oh god oh god oh god deliverance 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 it's up and down your aisle it's in your pew the Holy Ghost is hovering over you right now receive 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 your deliverance receive your healing receive the miracle. Receive your prayer life back. Receive your dedication back. Receive your consecration back. I'm making a comeback. Oh, no. Listen. The Lord has heard you. Oh, Basha. Listen to me closely, by, as the Holy Spirit is here. Listen to me. It's so important. Listen to me. Samson, Samson never slept with Delilah. Read your Bible. There was never a sexual consummation. Read your Bible. Samson did not lose his strength because he slept with her because he didn't sleep with her. He lost his strength because he made a promise to God he would never cut his hair. Hear me. And the enemy took his vow. Don't you know the devil knows that he, he can't get some of you to backslide? He knows that. He knows he can't get you to sin. He knows you've, you've been in the way too long. So he says, I, I know I can never get her, her to sin or him to sin. So, I got something else I don't need them to sin I just need them to break their promise and God himself will cut them off but tonight is a night of comeback touch your neighbor say I'm making a comeback touch someone behind you say I'm making a comeback and I'm getting double for my trouble. Everything I lost, I'm getting double. He stole my one hour prayer life. Now I'm about to pray two hours. He stole my one day a week fast. Now I'm about to fast two days a week. He stole me reading three chapters a day. Now I'm about to read six chapters a day. Oh, shut on side. We worship you, we worship you. Hear me. And the Lord has done a quick work. It doesn't take all day. It doesn't take all year. I'm here to tell you that when you walk out of here tonight, when you go home, you're going to feel stuff that's been... Hear me. Hear me about the Holy Ghost. I just heard the Lord say something. There are many dimensions of your life that have been on hold. 
because your life was out of order and there were promises and provisions that God made you but because there was a broken promise God had to hold it but tonight because you remade your vow and you reinitiated that level of relationship I hear the host releasing blessings that have been held up promises have been held up anointings and mystery. Like it has held. 